Good morning, church. Uh, just wanted to welcome everyone who has joined us at the hall this morning, and also, uh, you know, everyone who's joined us online. Uh, again, we're so glad, even though we might be just a few of us who have gathered, but what an awesome privilege it is to worship God, uh, to hear from His Word, to respond to Him, and also to fellowship together, uh, you know, as a body. And so we really pray at the gathering, we really pray that this time is not just, you know, uh, you know, two hours on a Sunday morning. We pray that this time is actually a time where each of us would get to encounter and meet with the Lord Jesus in a very personal and clear way, especially as God's word is being preached this morning, right? So if you've been tracking with us at the gathering, you would have noticed that we are going through the series titled, A Promise Keeping God from the book of Joshua, right? And in fact, we've been going through the series for about five months uh, from the start of this year. And finally, we've come to the last sermon of the series. You know, it's, a, it's great. All good things, unfortunately, come to an end. But uh, it's it's been such a wonderful time for us as we've been looking at the Old Testament and seeing how the Old Testament is actually in some way or the other pointing us to uh, the character of God and also to Jesus uh, in the New Testament. So today, even as we arrive at the final sermon, these two last two chapters, if you see, are actually two sermons that Joshua is preaching to the people of Israel, right? And these are the last words, last recorded words of Joshua as he's preaching to the people of Israel, right? And all of us have been around, grandparents, great-grandparents, the last words that they say are quite significant, right? You would say the last words. And so similarly, in this sense, Joshua, who's been a faithful leader of the Israelites for so many years, you know, he led them through that entire conquest, brought them into the promised land. Finally, as he's reaching, you know, the end of his life, he's giving these last two sermons. So I think it's important for us to also understand what that means for us, right? So I don't want to go and kind of read the entire passage, but I just want to read a few verses that will frame our time uh, just before we get into a time of prayer and also uh, listening to, to the word. So I'm going to read from Joshua 23 verses 4 to 8. It says, Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain along with all the nations that have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight. And you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore be very strong to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand or to the left that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of the gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them but you shall cling to the lord your god just as you have done to this day church let's pray father we come to you and we are just humble and bow down before you and your word this morning god god God, sometimes it's easy for us to come and approach a text like this on the basis of our righteousness, on the basis of our knowledge, on the basis of what we think we know about you, God, and, and, and what we think we know about ourselves. And God, we pray that we would come to you as, as people, as children, O oh Lord, who need to hear from you and who, for whom every single word is so important to God. And we pray, Lord, that as we hear your word this morning, that our hearts will be moved to love you, Lord. Our hearts would be moved to repent to God. And our hearts would be, Lord, moved to, Lord, obey you wholeheartedly, Lord. Would you help us to do that, Lord, in the light of your holy character, your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the most common things or 
familiar things that happens in a lot of corporates and organizations is they frequently will end up having these kind of orientations and trainings. And Akita is part of HR, so she knows, right? So you'll constantly have frequent trainings uh, where they'll give you an overview of the company, they'll talk about the culture of the company, and then they'll also list down the expectations, right? What's expected of you if you are an employee of this company? And along with that, they'll also mention what would happen in case you would actually breach or violate any of these uh, rules that are you know stated in the company and this is something that's not just done on the first day of you know of a person joining the company but it's done somehow repeatedly where time and time again it's needed for the company to reiterate those values and the culture and the expectations to the employees time and time again and it's interesting how in similar ways it seems like Joshua is giving this kind of orientation or training to the Israelites, telling them of what are the expectations that God has from them. The only big difference out here is that the Israelites are not part of some human organization. They're not here to serve a human master, right? The Israelites out here are trying to figure out what does it mean for them to actually serve a holy God, right? And and that's a big deal, right? Because because it's one thing for us to violate, you know, a rule in a company which might cost us a job or a penalty or something of that sort. It's another thing to actually violate, you know, the commands and the decree of God. What would that mean for them? But not only should we think about what would it mean for the Israelites in that time, I think it's important also for us, you know, relevant for us, all of us who uh, you know, call ourselves as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of us are also actually servants of God. You know, sometimes when we think about the word servants, we only think, you know, pastor is a servant of the Lord, an evangelist is a servant of the Lord, somebody who's doing full-time ministry, he's a servant of the Lord. But actually, if you're a believer in Christ, all of you are called to be a servant of the Lord. So it becomes important for us that's similar to, you know, in the company where they get to know what is the policy document, what are the policies to follow, what is the policy document for us as servants of the Lord, right? What is expected of us and what happens if we breach and violate, you know, this covenant and this relationship with God. And so these are quite serious and important questions for us to consider this morning. Would you agree, right? And so that's why I believe like the the title of my sermon this morning is what does it mean for us to be what, what does it mean for us to serve god what does it mean for us to be servants of god right and i think to help us answer this question this passage gives us at least three points right the first point is it tells us that we've all been given a choice to serve it tells us that we've been given a choice to serve god right? We are presented with a choice to serve God. Look with me at Joshua 24 verses 14 to 15. It says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, church, if you've been to any Christian's home, right, like this is a common plaque, you know, or a verse that you'll see hung somewhere or the other, right? Usually it's the gift that we give, like when people has their housewarming, you know, this is a lovely plaque that is given to them. And it's a nice encouraging verse, right? To say that, you know, just as, you know, Joshua, you know, was fully committed to the Lord, we are committing and dedicating our entire house to the Lord, household to the Lord. You know, that's, that's the sense in which people do. And that's great, but sometimes we end up missing the context in which that verse was actually said, you know, it's, it's, it's actually towards the end of Joshua's sermon, right? It's in the end part of Joshua's sermon, where Joshua is actually presenting them with, you know, with a choice that they have to make. He's saying that either you guys choose to serve Yahweh, you know, the God who has been so faithful to you, or you go back to serving these other gods. It's either this or that there is no 
in between. You know, that's the kind of choice that he's actually presenting to them. And that's, that's I think, interesting for us, right? When we look at that verse, a very familiar verse, when, when Joshua is saying that, as for me, and my, it's, it's actually told in the context of, a, you know, a serious choice that the people actually have to make right before them. And it's so interesting that, that this choice that, or this response that he is trying to evoke out of them, it's coming at the end of the sermon. But just prior to that, he actually spends a lot of time reminding them on the faithfulness of God. It's so interesting. Look at the pattern. He's not coming and saying, guys, you need to follow and obey God or choose if you want to do that and go on to telling something else. It's very interesting that he starts by talking about God's faithfulness. And then he says, now, guys, it's up to you. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Right. And it's so interesting. I just want to summarize what Joshua was trying to say here. Joshua was tracing back the journey of Israel, not just from the time of Moses, but from the time of Abraham, how God has been faithful through the ages towards the people of Israel. He starts by saying, you know what, Abraham, he actually was not coming from a believing background. He was coming from a non-believing background. He was actually, you know, in a lifestyle of pagan worship and God pulled him out of that and revealed himself to him. And then after that, Abraham, we know he was too old to be a dad, right? And, and God had still blessed him and gave him Isaac. And through Isaac, God had given and created this huge nation right and then 400 years after that as this nation grew in number they were found enslaved in the land of egypt and when they were crying out to god out of their enslavement god came to redeem them with a mighty hand right and we know we know all the 10 plagues that the land of egypt went through before the israelites were allowed out of there and then when 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 the israelites came to the shore of the red sea you had the mighty egyptians chasing after them saying that we're not going to leave them right and so they have this entire sea in front of them they have the mighty egyptians behind them and what does god do he parts the Red Sea and he allows his people to pass through it. And when the Egyptians come through the Red Sea, what happens? God brings back the sea and drowns them all and they're totally destroyed. All the enemies of the Israelites were destroyed because the Lord was fighting for them. But God didn't just fight for them, you know, against the Egyptians, with every single nation that the Israelites went up against, right? And we saw about 30 or 40, uh, you know, kings and cities that the Israelites went through in the promised land. And through all of them, it's so interesting that it was the Lord that was fighting for them. You know, it's so interesting in verses in chapter 23, it says that these nations were actually much greater in number and much greater in might than the Israelites. You know, but still, even though the Israelites didn't have all that strength amongst themselves, because God was fighting for them, it was like one man was as stronger than maybe about a thousand men from the neighboring nations, right? That was the kind of impact, that was the kind of help that God was providing to his people. And just to sum up what Joshua was trying to say here, I think he says it brilliantly in, in twin, uh, Joshua 24 verses 12 and 13 where it says that, and I send the hornet before you, which drove them out before you. The two kings of the Amorites, it was not by your sword or by your bow. It was not by their strength that they actually were able to defeat these nations. Verses 13, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of the vineyards and the olive orchards that you did not plant, right? And so why is God telling these things to his people through Joshua? Why? Because God's heart, I believe, was that as he was reminding them of his faithfulness, as he was reminding them of his generosity, as he was reminding them of his kindness and his love towards them, that they would be moved to wholeheartedly serve and obey God, right? And isn't that the pattern we see right throughout scripture? You know, we, we know that passage from 1 John where it tells us we love because he loved us first, right? So it's always the love, it's always the faithfulness, the, the kindness of God that moves us to actually respond in love and obedience back to God. 
and it's in that context that they said see this is what yahweh god has done for you this is how god has redeemed you this is how loving he's been to you though you did not deserve it he gave you much more than what you deserved and now you're enjoying the fruit of all that god has done for you now you choose who are you going to serve today are you going to serve god this god or you're going to serve these other gods who did nothing for you right and and i think about you know if you've been coming to the gathering for a while you would have noticed that it's pretty much the same message that we preach every single week right like there's no new revelation you know uh, there's no really awesome story or illustration that we bring out it's the same same message that we actually preach week after week and and it's not because we don't want to be exciting we don't want to be different we don't want to be unique we obviously want to be faithful to the text that god has given us but it's also because one of our convictions is that we realize that unless god's faithfulness god's kindness god's generosity is reminded to his people week after week we have no ability to actually serve god apart from that that's the conviction why we actually preach the same message again week after week year after year because we believe that we might come and we might say you know i want to worship god i'm going to serve god but without like all of that is impossible without remembering the faithfulness and the kindness and the generosity of our god and so even this week even today i believe we are all confronted with the same question again if this question was posed to us choose this day whom you will serve what would our response be today and it's not a choice that we just made sometime in the past or i made that choice 5 years ago it's a choice that we daily need to make are we going to continue to serve god and it's even true for me right who are we going to serve are we going to serve the god who has been loving and who has redeemed us who's redeemed us from our slavery to sin and death or are we going to serve our jobs are we going to serve our relationships are we going to serve sex are we going to serve money are we going to serve the pleasures of this world choose this day whom you're going to serve and i want us to just take a minute to just think on that question because it's very important because that hits the core of of what we believe in and if you think about it if you actually love someone you make a choice to actually love that person right it's a daily choice like in marriage like you're daily making a choice to actually love your spouse right and similarly if you're saying that we actually love god there's a daily choice that we have to make to actually serve and follow and obey him wholeheartedly and i think that's why you know even for us as a church we are confronted with the very same question whom do we serve whom do we serve and i think you know i think it's important for us to just have that thought at the back of our minds but remember that the choice that is put in front of us the context of that choice is framed by what god has already done for us right god's faithfulness god's love god's kindness and he's saying now you guys choose whom you're going to serve right so that's the first thing that i want us to remember like what does it mean for us to serve god firstly it means that there is a choice that we have to actually serve god secondly but it also tells us in this passage that though there is a choice to serve god we also have an inability to actually serve god It's so interesting look with me at verses 19 and 20 from joshua 24 but joshua said to the people you are not able to serve the lord for he is a holy god he is a jealous god he will not forgive your transgressions or your sins if you forsake the lord and serve foreign gods then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good i wonder what the people thought when they actually heard this right because joshua said choose this day and they said you know far be it from us to actually choose anyone else 
We're going to serve the Lord. And what does Joshua say in response? You cannot serve God. <laughs> you know, if I were there, I would be like, well, thank you, Joshua. <laughs> that was so encouraging of you. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying, you know, I've got all my best intentions in place. I'm stating my commitment, but you still don't seem convinced. You still don't seem convinced that I'm actually here. I'm actually serious about trying to serve and follow God. But, but let's realize, like, why did Joshua say what he did? And he gives us a few reasons, right? Firstly, he says it's because our God is a holy God. That's what he says out there. Our God is a holy God. You know, Habakkuk 1 verses 13, it's a, it's a familiar verse where it says that you are of purer eyes, talking about God. God has purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. God is ho so holy that he can't even look at sin and wrong and tolerate it. And I was looking at one thing, what a com commentator said, and he said that God's hatred of wrong is pictured by his not being able to look at it. If God were to actually look at it, they must perish. Think about that, right? That's the holiness of God. That if God were to actually look at sin, then that, that person, whoever committed sin, would be consumed by his holiness, would be consumed by his justice. He would not survive. Like that's the holiness of God that we are talking about. But not only does he tell you about God's holiness, he also tells that our God is a jealous God. And for some of us, this might be a contradiction, right? How can God be holy and how can he be jealous at the same time? And let me tell you that this jealous that's being spoken about here is not just, you know, the envy that we experience, you know, where we are envious of someone else. This jealousy is talking more about the jealousy in, you know, in a marriage relationship, you know, where where there is a this one for fidelity and loyalty between the husband and the wife. You know, think about it in those terms. And that's why one of the most common analogies that's being used between our relationship with God is actually adultery and faithfulness. When we actually sin against God, when we go against, when we go after the idols and these other lovers in our lives, that's what it's adultery against God. You know, we're committing spiritual adultery against God. And so it's in that context that God is saying that, you know, that he's a jealous God, that he cannot tolerate between God's faithful relationship with us. He cannot, it, that relationship cannot be shared with another. It's a unique, special, covenantal relationship that God has with his people. And then it goes on to say that, that if you do that, God will not forgive your transgressions or your sins now that doesn't mean that god is harboring unforgiveness in his heart that doesn't mean that god is going to say now no more am i going to forgive you but it, what it's trying to say is that that god will not leave any sin unpunished god will have to meet the right justice and will need to exact the right penalty for the sins that have been committed his holy character cannot overlook our sins and that's why he'll need to pour out his anger on us because of our sins you know that's why in in romans 6 23 you know what it says it says the wages of sin is death right and this death is is not just the physical death that we go through but it is being separated from god eternally and i think that's the worst punishment that any of us could actually go through it's one thing to say that, you know, like how the, the people in the Old Testament where they would perish from the land is what were given. But think about what it would be if God were to come and say, you know, you're running after these lovers, fine. Now I'm giving you up to them. No longer am I going to have this relationship with you. Think about what that's like, where eternally God is giving us up to our sins and to our desires and to all of that saying, fine. And I think that's the worst thing, more than any other wrath or any other judgment that we have to face, than to be like, you know, I will be spiritually separated from God forever. And so on one hand, you see Joshua bring that to light, saying, hey, this is a holy God that you're worshipping. He's a jealous God and he will, not, he will not leave your sins unpunished. But also at the same time, I think Joshua also recognizes the fact that none of the people that he's talking to, including himself, 
can perfectly and consistently serve God as they should. None of them can perfectly and consistently obey God as they should. You know, I don't know, among us, some of us might be perfectionists today. We're go-getters. You know, if we put our mind to something, we know how to get it done. And we're really good. We're very disciplined in certain aspects. And it's humbling for us to even realize that even if you might be a perfectionist, even if you're really good at managing yourself and your time and your sins or whatever that might be, just to realize that even that's not good enough for God. Isn't it humbling? Yeah? Just to think that that's not good enough. In fact, we know that verse from Isaiah 64 where it says, all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. All our good works are like a soiled cloth before God. We are worthy of judgment, not just because of our bad things, but also for our good things, because our good things are also marred with sin. Our good things also come out of wrong motivations of our heart. So even if we look at ourselves and we're like, you know, we can figure it out. We just, we know how to serve God. You know, I have the strength in myself. It's humbling to realize that our best of efforts is not good enough for a holy God. But it's not just for that category of people who are perfectionists. Some of us are just people who are good enough just to get past mark, right? That's, that's me, right? We are happy as long as we can get past the mark. We're happy, you know, get the 33%, the minimum that is needed. And so we think that, you know, we'll come to the, you know, to the passing mark and God in his grace will understand. God knows my heart. God knows my intentions. So God will understand. And it's interesting that, that even the Israelites in this point, they had great intentions. They all had all the right intentions. But what did Joshua tell them? You cannot serve the Lord. You're not able to serve the Lord. So isn't it humbling, church, just to realize our best efforts and our best intentions are just simply not good enough for a holy God? Why? Because the, the problem goes deeper than what, what we see, than what's on the surface. The problem is a sin-infected heart. Everything that we do comes out of a heart of sin. Everything that we do. And that's, what, that's why it renders us incapable and unable to actually serve a holy God. And that's why, church, just think about it, right? How many times on a Sunday morning we come and we hear God's word? And how many times we make these great promises in our hearts? How many times we come and we say, you know, we make great commitments to God after a Sunday service? And, and there is a reason why we're not able to live up to it, why we fail on those promises. It's not because we don't have the best intentions. It's not because, you know, we don't have the best of self-will or uh, discipline or best efforts. It's actually because there's an issue with our heart and we are unable to help ourselves by just our intentions or our efforts. Even as Joshua is kind of questioning them, saying, you guys are not going to serve God. It's actually to help them understand that they need to look for help outside of themselves. You know? Even at this last part of Joshua, where we've actually seen the Israelites being faithful for, for quite a while, Joshua is kind of reminding them, saying, hey, you know what? You're not going to be faithful for too long. Your sin is going to find you. You're going to desert the Lord. You're going to abandon the Lord. You're going to forsake this Lord whom, who has been so faithful to you. And that's true for all of our hearts today also. We can say great commitments, but we'll still go away from that. Why? Because there's a problem on the inside. And we need help from the outside. And so that's why as we recognize that we have been given a choice to serve and that there's an inability for us to serve, that should lead us to the third point, which is the gracious provision to serve. We've all been given a gracious provision to serve God. So church, you might have noticed as we were going through the reading, that the Old Testament covenant was being talked about here, right? And that was a conditional covenant, right? If you guys could just look at Joshua 23 verses 14 and 16. So if you just look at this, you can see the conditional aspect of the covenant in the Old Testament. So this is what Joshua is saying. And now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. 
right? Time to say amen to that, right? Amen, right? Like, all have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed, but just, and now look at that, that but is very important, right? But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from the good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given you. Right? So you can see the conditional element, right? On one side, God is saying, my favor, my blessing will be on you when you're being faithful. But on the other hand, when the people are being unfaithful, there's a curse that is upon them. And that's, and that's not because God is not loving or forgiving enough. It's because God has to meet the just punishment for their sins. That's why. Right? And so, as we even saw in the last, because we have sinful hearts, it's virtually impossible for us to actually serve God based on our faithfulness. It's virtually impossible for us to secure blessings from God on the basis of our faithfulness. And that's why a gracious provision from God is needed for us to enter into a new covenant with the Lord. Right? So as we're looking at this old covenant, it's reminding us that hey, this, there is so many limitations to this because of our sinful hearts. We need a new covenant to actually help us out. So I want you guys to just read a couple of verses. This is from Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34. I want you just to pay attention to each and every verse because it's so loaded. It's so important for all of us to recognize, right? Verses 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. Right? So again, the spiritual adultery that we are talking about, that God is being this faithful husband to his people and his people are committing adultery by forsaking the Lord. Verses 33 says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. Right? So what's being said here is we have a problem with a sin infection in our hearts, right? So now God's going to do a heart surgery for us, right? God's going to actually renew and change our hearts to help us to actually serve God, right? And then goes on to say, and I will be their God and they will be my people, right? In a sense, God is saying that no longer are you guys not going to be my people. This thing is going to seal it once and for all, where forever and ever, I will be your God and you will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Talking about the close fellowship that his people are going to have. Like if you're a believer in Christ, you don't need someone to go and say, Hey, you know what? This is, this is what close fellowship with God looks like. No, you have been given direct access to God. Like you don't need a mediator any longer. Basically is what I'm trying to say. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Talking about the full pardon and cleansing that we will receive through the work of Jesus. Right? And so it's so amazing that this gracious provision of God did not come in the form of a monument or a stone that they set up. It did not come in the form of a tablet, you know, uh, the stone tablets with the commandments. This uh, new covenant was ushered and this gracious provision came to us through a person. And this person is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God's own son. Jesus lived the life which was perfect and consistent with what God requires from us. Think about it, church, right? Every place where we failed in our service to God, Jesus, as our substitute, faithfully lived that, perfectly lived that, and consistently lived that, right? And then he died the death that all of us deserved. Though he was, you know, perfect and holy, but he chose to die for us, bearing the sin, bearing the punishment that all of us deserved. He was buried 
and then three days later he rose from the grave so that whoever may repent of their sins and put their faith in what Jesus has done they would no longer have to face the curse of God and they would be they would enjoy God's blessing forever and ever right think about what was happening in the old covenant right old covenant is if you are faithful blessing if you are unfaithful curse and here by Jesus actually taking on that curse for us he has now remove that curse completely from us so that all of us who trust in him will only enjoy his blessings forever and ever let's take a minute to just introspect on what that actually looked like for all of us this morning you know maybe for some of us we've been carrying we are tired of carrying that load of faithful unfaithful kind of uh, where, where we feel like if we have been faithful god is happy with us if you're being unfaithful then god is angry at us i don't know if some of us are just carrying that burden in our relationship in our walk with god our relationship with god is on the basis of how committed how faithful how sorted we are that's the basis on which we have a relation or we see a relationship with god and and that burden is just too much to carry on our shoulders so we're constantly oscillating between security and insecurity all the time because it's based on our faithfulness which is always up and down right and so we need to realize that there is a better covenant that is already handed out to us the better covenant which has been initiated through the loving work of our lord and savior jesus christ through the cross of calvary you know what the word says that jesus became the curse for us by hanging on the tree jesus actually became the curse for us and through faith in jesus ephesians 1 3 says that he has granted to us each and every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and that is a blessing that we have for all of eternity what would it mean for us to today embrace that gracious provision that god has handed out to us what would it mean for us I don't know church if you remember or if you've heard of this guy called Derek Raymond. You heard of him? Derek Raymond, right? So even if you're not familiar with the name, you would have definitely seen this viral video on social media. So Derek Raymond was a British runner, right? And he ran in the uh, Olympics over the 80s and the early 90s. And and in the 1992 Summer Olympics, you know, he was uh, poised to actually win the 400 meter sprint he was a 400 400 meter runner right and so uh, during the first round he clocked the fastest time in the first round and then in the quarter finals he actually won his own race and he landed up in the semi finals but something happened during the semi finals during the semi finals you know he started off well but maybe 250 meters away from the finish line he tore his hamstring he tore his hamstring and so he was unable to actually carry on so what happened at that point of time the the paramedics they ran in with stretchers and they were trying to take him off the the track but he declined he said no i'm trying to kind of still finish this but he couldn't he was in excruciating pain he was limping and he was hobbling one after the other and on the sidelines you had his dad jim raymond actually sit out there and he's looking at his son he's like my son is in pain and my son is trying to finish the race so what he does he barges past the security runs and holds his son in his arm and he helps his son actually finish the race and i wonder if in some ways that is a visual picture of what jesus has actually done for us when it came to actually serving god when it comes to serving god church all of us are like in that debilitated injured state where we are in pain we are in misery we have no ability to actually reach the finish and what's the finish line it is fully accepting service to god or a relationship with god and where we needed a big brother jesus christ to actually come for us and he came to us he came to us held us together and he, and it's the basis of his performance that now we are able to actually have that relationship with god and i wonder if that's what we need to actually think about even this morning you know 
I don't know if for some of us, we, we look at our relationship with God on the basis of our works, how good we've been, how well we've resisted pornography, you know, how we've shared the gospel, how we've read our Bible and had devotionals this, this week. I don't know if we actually look at our relationship with God on the basis of those things. And what I want to say on the basis of this is, this is asking us to abandon all of that. See ourselves for the injured, infected, helpless state that we're in, and then hold on to Jesus who can actually help us bring, bring us back to God. Maybe you're hearing this for the first time, where first time as you're listening to it, you're, you're being encountered with this truth that you can't make it on your own. You can't have a relationship with God on your own. And you need to recognize that the only way you can have that is through the perfect life and the perfect death of Jesus. And even for us, if you call yourself a believer in Christ, you know how easy it is for us to assume that performance mentality how easy it is to look and say, hey, you know what, I've been, I've been reading my Bible every day. You know, I've, I've been ministering to people. For me, like I'm honestly saying, like I'm preaching in the church, serving God, I'm serving God's people. I've been such a faithful husband. And we look at all of these things and this, these are our anchors to help us say, God, this is why, this is why I'm able to serve you. No, let those words of Joshua Humble us this morning. You are not able to serve God. You cannot. You cannot serve God. But there is one who knows how to serve God, how he expects, and that is Jesus Christ. He has done what you, in every way where all of us have failed. Hold on to him. Run to him. Trust him. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. Church, let's just close in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for you know, just this time with the word. Thank you for speaking to us, O oh Lord, and just reminding us, God, that God, you have given all of us a choice to serve this morning, Lord. Whether we serve you, who has been so faithful to us, or we serve, Lord, our desires, our pleasures, and the people in our life. So that choice is given to us, but we know that, Lord, even in our best intentions, even in our best efforts, God, we are not able to serve you, God, as you expect. Because you're a holy God. You're a God, O oh Lord, who demands loyalty and fidelity with us, people who always are wandering and going away. And Lord, we are people, O oh Lord, who have got sin-infected hearts. Lord. Where is the hope in ourselves? There is no hope, Lord. But thank you, Lord, that through your Son, through your own Son, you have brought in this gracious provision, O oh Lord, where he has done what we could not do, and he has paid the price for all the wrongs that we have done. God, we pray, Lord, that, that we would trust in Jesus today. We would exalt Jesus today. We would thank Jesus today for this mighty love and kindness and mercy that has been showered on us. God, would you help us to do so, Lord. In Jesus' name we make this prayer. Amen.